Namaskaram, Ashwin. Sadhguru, Namaskaram. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you're doing well in Chennai. Chennai is exploding with all these infections, huh? <laughs> Initially, I felt like I was okay. But now I'm getting really edgy. I want to go out and play or do something like that. I'm getting really edgy inside the house. Hmm. Uh, no, but uh, Tamil Nadu was well controlled uh, in the beginning, first three weeks, but uh, now it's going off. But uh, is it, uh, is it, isn't it like uh, the fact that it will go in high numbers all over the country? I don't know because the numbers are increasing every day. It's getting a little concern. The, yes, it is at the same time. Uh, Almost uh, seventy percent or seventy-five percent is within twenty districts. That way it's not spread. But now this uh, migrant labor has gone across the country, back home. So will they spread it there is a question. But I generally feel uh, the rural population may be having a enough immune system within themselves that they may not be casualties there big time except very vulnerable very aged group of people. See, everybody is talking about this herd immunity and all this stuff. If you go that way, if you go towards herd immunity, you will wipe out the geriatric population in the country or in the world. So, that is not a really an option, but if it goes away, runs away in that direction... Uh, but uh, Sadhguru, tell me something in, 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 the in, the, in this current situation where we are standing, uh, what is the direction that uh, people should look for? Because uh, at one side of it, a lot of people are looking for livelihoods. A lot of people, I mean, thankfully we are all blessed. I am in the blessed category where I can still have sufficient to eat on a day-to-day -day basis and still manage to handle my anxieties. Then there are another set of people who are struggling to run their businesses. The economy is suffering. W what is the answer to this? How long will people have to bite the bullet? See, uh... No nation can afford to close itself down forever, okay? We have done exemplarily well, actually. Over sixty-five days, uh, we've been closed. I think with uh, ninety-five percent pass mark, maybe two to five percent might have failed, but largely we've done that. But the nature of the virus is such, if there is one person left with infection, he will again start a new cycle. That's how it is, because even if you have been infected once and you come out negative later, still you are vulnerable to infection, that is what we are seeing. So having said that, uh, it is… unfortunately, maybe in the end we only have to think of uh, herd immunity, but that will be a terrible thing, because uh, our parents, grandparents will all get wiped out. That's what it means. So, there is… Uh, see, there is no clear voice from the scientific community anywhere in the world. To say this is the nature of this virus, we can do this, there is no clear voice about that because nobody has figured out what exactly it is. There is still debates going on. I was talking to, uh, you know, this Global Doctors Association, and they are saying every day they are publishing now, writing hundred and twenty-eight papers per day is being done, thousands of papers. Every day somebody is discovering something new about the virus and they are writing on it, hundred and twenty-eight per day average is happening. So that means we are that confused, all right? So without a clear perception that this is the nature of the virus, this is how it will behave, even if we don't find a vaccine, at least if we have a proper, you know, treatment protocol, yeah. we can feel comfortable. Right now, there is no treatment protocol. Somebody says take hydrochloroquine, somebody says take that Ebola drug, somebody says take the HIV drug, somebody says drink Lysol, you know, it's like <laughs> variety of things. Well, uh, we are giving Nilavembu to everybody. We just uh, shooting, you know, we're shooting in the dark, literally. Only thing we can do is strengthening the immune system. For this, we have protocols, which is what we are doing, and we are trying to mass, uh, you know, implement it as far as possible. Some simple yogic practice, little bit of care about what you eat, and a few other Ayurvedic and Siddha concoctions, which will boost the immune system. This got nothing to do with the virus. 
something to do with us. With the ability to fight. Sadhguru, just one more question I've been wanting to ask and I seem to find it very difficult to get answers very clearly. You can ask me any question, don't throw me carom ball and all, I'll hit it for a six, be careful. <laughs> No, I will… I will come to your cricket abilities very soon, Sadhguru, because I've seen you play all sport. I want to understand, what are you? Are you a bowler or a batsman, Sadhguru? <laughs> I was an all-rounder in the school, but uh, once I got to college, I got more involved with field hockey and kind of dropped my cricket. Okay, but did you find cricket exciting or hockey was a better sport? Uh, hockey was more ex exciting because you're always on your feet and doing something. Cricket today, the way you guys are playing, whatever, 2020, all of you are on the edge. But otherwise, those days, if they put you on the boundary, you just stand there for 20, 30 minutes doing nothing in the sun, okay <laughs> So, it was not… Uh, it was not my cup of tea. <laughs> Sadhguru, uh, the, the question I wanted to ask was, uh, in general, over the last… I've lived for 30 years, so in the 30 years, whatever has been struck, you know, a, a massive earthquake in Christchurch, a tsunami in the borders, Indonesia, India, all these borders. For everything that has sort of been very emergency, we have found a mechanism to deal with it, right? At least, if not then and there, we've had a tsunami alert system, an earthquake, you know, a resistant uh, building mechanism, alerting people, all these things are always come about. And we boast ourselves as a very modern tech, we, we're very, very advanced in terms of technology. How did we not see this coming? And like literally you said, three, four months and most people are not able to come up with an answer. Isn't that scary? Well, uh, see, whenever major events happen, we find answers with tsunami after the tsunami is over, all right? <laughs> so next time, will it work the same way? We don't know. But natural calamities, there is a history uh, of thousands of years of memory and history and experience of it. Even though we are surprised sometimes, we still know what it is because it hits you at a certain time and it's over. If a tsunami happened, ten thousand people died, that's it. It's not going to come every day and kill you, that's a different kind of thing. So earthquakes have happened in Gujarat and all, it killed nearly, I don't know, from hundred thousand people, I think. So, but it's a one-time thing. Only thing is, it also destroys your property. This leaves your property, just cleans you up. All right, <laughs> this is a different kind of thing. This is the nature of virus. Uh, in the last uh, fifty years' time, of the three hundred and thirty-five diseases, nearly seventy percent are zootonic, that means they've come from the animals, either bacteria or virus. So this particular virus is not a deadly killer, that is the advantage and that is a big disadvantage. See, when the influenza and other things happened, the what is called a Spanish flu today, it just killed everybody. When the plague came, it just wipes out a whole village. So, the response to that was different. Here, the problem is most of them are asymptomatic. Nearly eighty percent are asymptomatic and they're going all over the place spreading. There's no sign of any illness. So, it's like you're sitting, you and me could be carrying it. And uh, we don't know because it doesn't show any signs. That is the biggest problem and it is largely aiming only at vulnerable population. It is not going for the general population. Below one year of age, infants and over sixty-five, seventy years and in between for some reason if their immune systems are not strong enough or if the exposure is too heavy, like medical personnel are dying, police are, uh, you know, unfortunately it's taking a toll. That is because of the level of exposure. So having said that, why we don't have an answer is definitely there is something strange about this. But at the same time, in… at any time when we had these epidemics and pandemics, especially the virus attacks that we've had, we never figured it out, it just went away by itself. Because virus doesn't see you as an enemy, it is seeing you as a habitat. So it is not interested in killing you. Probably in a few months, it will learn the nature of… or the strength of the human system and adjust itself. You know, kind of mutate itself to a lower level of intensity where it can live with us. Right now in our bodies, millions and millions of, uh, you know, viruses and bacteria are living with us right now. For example, tuberculosis for uh, example, if you take it.
Right now, uh, India has set a goal by 2025, we'll get rid of tuberculosis. The basic test that is done for tuberculosis around the world is called Mantos test. If you and me go for a test, any Indian goes for a test, we will all show positive. We all have tuberculosis bacilli, but we don't have the disease. But all Indians have it. So, uh, the tuberculosis bacilli, we want to eliminate by 2025, but they are all living with us and we have no issue, most of us, only if its concentration goes to a certain point, it becomes a disease. Otherwise, almost all Indians carry this quite normally. If the same level of bacilli happens to, let's say, an American or a European person, they will fall sick. We are not falling sick because we have lived with that uh, for so long. So that is what we are looking for as a solution, that's what herd immunity means, that at some point we may get used to the virus. But before that, how many lives will it take? This is a… this is not a decision that you make, it may go that way, unfortunately. Okay, an, uh, an interesting question I've been wanting to ask you for a long time, Sadhguru. Uh, this thing where you speak about Ramayana, Mahabharata and all our uh, so-called mythology now, uh, everybody has a different connotation to whether it happened or doesn't… didn't happen. No, that… Uh, maybe... no, no, that argument is only in Chennai <laughs> Whether it no, happened or not. No. These, are, these are beliefs, I do not want to get into it, but… You said something very interesting when it came to all these uh, epics or mythologies, however you seem to believe. You said, there is so much to learn rather, rather than testing the authenticity of whether it happened or not happened, right? Do we have anything tracing back to those times uh, in order to deal with such a situation that we are in right now? See, the advantage uh, that those times had was the concentration of population was… has never been like this, okay? So, if it did happen, let us say it happened in Ayodhya, it would not uh, come to Chennai for sure. Only Rama came, he should have brought, but fourteen days quarantine would have happened by the time he walked down <laughs> Maybe, I mean he walked through the uh, Ram Sedu dam… Uh, thing, the thing as well, so it must have gone there as well, not a problem. No, no, see. by the time he walked from Ayodhya to Tamil Nadu border, more than fourteen days, so quarantine was over. And he must have traveled, he must have walked through, right? Yes, by foot. So it would have taken months, so by then it was over. It's because of air travel. It is essentially because of air travel, so quickly it's across the world. Right. In fact, uh, in fact, I felt like I, I came… came into India from New Zealand in March, when the virus was actually hitting through the, you know, Singapore and the Chinese region and going into America and all that. At that point of time, it didn't feel like… I mean, all of us were sitting in the… inside the zone of saying, you know what, it will not happen in India. There is so much heat, there is so much, you know, uh, in fact, let rightly put, so much ignorance amongst the people. Sometimes we believe we shut our eyes inside a closed room and believe there is nothing happening wrong. Even today, you know, uh, I was talking to a couple of my uh, cricketing colleagues and they happened to say, you know, it's become normal, we have to deal with it like cold and fever. We are not yet there, right? No, no, see… Young people may deal with it just as cold and fever. That too, if they're, you know, if they have a sturdy uh, uh, constitution. But that's not how it is. People are just falling dead all over the place. When uh, nearly half a million people have died, you can't say it's cold and fever. But at the same time, every year, influenza in America kills fifty, sixty thousand people like this. But this is not going to pass like that virus. This can continue and come back in waves and waves, it is possible, but we still don't know. We… I have a gut feeling in India, by mid-September, towards the end of September, it will be largely gone and our economic activity will be back to normal. It may not be where it was a few months ago, but in terms of activity, it will be back. But I have no data, not an iota of data to support my gut feeling. There's no data. No, gut feeling is the best feeling that we all can have in terms of reassurance. <laughs> but just… Uh, just… just on another note, Sadhguru, I saw some… Uh, some uh, article and some video where I'm sure you're aware of Leonardo DiCaprio who's doing a lot of things with regards to climate change. Uh, he had put out a tweet and an Instagram post saying a lot of people who have been affected by pollution over the years are tending to receive this virus in a very, very, uh, you know, 
a detrimental fashion. Uh, are, is this virus in any way relation of what we have done? You said there is something funny about it. Any relation to what we have done to the environment and how we have, you know, uh, sort of uh, just polluted and populated it all over the place? Is it, is it our doing? Population is definitely our doing. Right. Pollution is also our doing. <laughs> is there any doubt about it? No. Any, anything other than that, environmentally, how we have, uh, you know, not, not respected nature over the years? See, uh, right now, one of the major reasons why people are dying because of the virus is hypoxia. That means not enough oxygen in the system, so lungs collapse after some time, whatever happens, other systems fail. In a way, if you're living in an Indian city or let's say any big city, particularly Indian cities, in many ways you are heading towards hypoxia if you just travel on the uh, let's say Chennai, Mumbai, Bangalore roads for one or two hours every day uh, in open, suppose your car is not air-conditioned and you're open like on a two-wheeler or you're just walking, then definitely the oxygen levels in your blood will be lower than what it should be. So definitely you are moving into that vulnerable population region, maybe not necessarily, but you're in the direction at least for sure. It may vary from individual to individual, but when you live in this kind of atmosphere where oxygen levels are low, carbon monoxide and other particulate matter is heavy, definitely your pulmonary system is not at the same level as it should be. So you are becoming a vulnerable population, even now you're seeing almost seventy percent of the cases are just in five, six cities in the country probably, about ten to ten to twelve cities maximum. Rest of the country doesn't have it, the rural population doesn't really have it. And one more thing that I've constantly been telling in the ashram everybody is practicing right now is to stay in touch with the earth. If you stay in touch with the earth, your immune system is always many times stronger than other people. So this is one of the treatments we do for all the patients who come, I must tell you this situation. We used to… earlier, now we are calling it rejuvenation center, but at one time we used to call this Isha Yogic Hospital. There was a hospital. So about ten, twelve doctors from Michigan area, from the Ford uh, medical, uh, you know, system, they came here because they were very interested in the yogic hospital. So I couldn't meet them, they were here for about three days and uh, I'm talking many years ago, like about twenty-two years ago or so. So they came and uh, after the third day, it seems they got very angry, they called me in the morning and said, Sadhguru, their uh, doctors are all very upset, they want to leave right away. I said, what is the issue? We said, we don't know, they're screaming and yelling. I went to meet them. Then I said, what is the problem? They said, you said there is a yogic hospital. We walked around everywhere in the center, there is no hospital here. Oh, I said, okay, your idea of a hospital is that there must be beds, people must be lying down, some other, somebody must be serving them. If you provide that kind of hospitality, nobody will get well. <laughs> See, children always like to fall sick. How old are your children, huh? They're about five and three and a half. Yeah, that three and a half guy, watch him, because they like to fall sick. Because when they are sick, everybody does mo 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 mo, poo 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 and all that, they love it, okay? <laughs> Every child learns at an early age that if you are unwell, if you are miserable, if you cry, you get lots of attention. If you are happy, joyful, screaming and you're dancing around, you don't get attention. This is a thing that every family has to change. So I said, no, 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 that's not the way it is. I had about hundred and ten people on that day who are going through some treatments. I said, see, in this hospital, we wake them at five o'clock, five-thirty they have to be there for the sadhana. Eight o'clock sadhana is over, then I put them to work in the garden or in the kitchen or somewhere else where they have to use their hands and everything and they may get little more rest than others. That's it, they're under medication and practices but they have to be involved and especially with the earth they must be involved. Then I took them around and made them meet all the people who were working in the garden <laughs> Our patients were all working hard <laughs> <laughs> so they will want to get well if you make them working, work hard, <laughs> always. Because you said that you need to be in touch with earth, I'm asking this, uh, a lot… There are, there are two schools of uh, medical treatment, it's not two, may, maybe more than that. Uh, but off late, I'm getting, getting attached to this sort of theory where 
the body knows to treat itself are we over treating ourselves because we get an influenza or a virus is there a tendency that we over treat our body and kind of misguide it uh i would say i i cannot comment about you as an individual but as a as a human population this generation of people are we over treating 100% we are over treating we are overdoing everything in the sense right now the pharmaceutical industry is uh, bigger than the food industry i think am i right it must be it, it is, is on the becoming the biggest right yeah <laughs> the largest industry is uh, arms and armaments second largest is pharmaceuticals the third one is alcohol and tobacco and these things put together so one is a clear death another takes you towards it another pretends to get you back <laughs> having said that i am not trying to discount uh, the impact of modern medicine you and me are alive today probably only because of modern medicine otherwise small things could have killed us average life expectancy of an indian was 28 28 years in 1947 today it is 73 or 74 which is a significant achievement for the nation but that's not happened without vaccines and things like that otherwise uh, anything smallpox this that could have killed us so our life we owe it to modern medicine there's no question but in present conditions at the level of concentration of populations that we have without modern medicine i don't think we can survive without pharmaceuticals you cannot survive there was a time when people lived in nature there was substantial space for every human being then it was possible to just eat some leaves or eat some fruit or just fast for two days and get well all this even now you can do if you're maintaining your lifestyle like that but every day you're out in the town meeting a thousand people and mixing with people then if something catches up then you better take some medicine otherwise it'll be risky sadguru another important uh, thing as far as i was concerned i was very enamored by the whole thing of uh, kaveri calling right and uh, you explained in detail about what kaveri calling is mm -hmm. and how much of uh, deforestation has happened and we need to reforest them to get the land back water needs to be i mean water the land needs to have the ability to hold the water on and all that sort of stuff how, how far are we uh, in in the zone of rehabilitating i know it's a long term process but uh, how much have we made strides uh, sadguru see the significant thing is uh, the karnataka government announced a subsidy for the farmer for every tree 125 rupees subsidy has been allotted not only that for for somebody who encourages somebody to plant a tree he gets 5 rupees suppose you are the farmer i make you plant 100 trees now i get 500 rupees for this so now we are training youth to be agents of change so they can take this up like a part time profession that they meet uh, the farmers in the local areas because they know each other they related largely they can talk to them and encourage them and may facilitate this stuff because both will benefit he will get subsidy this guy will get 5 rupees commission for that so this process is already on this monsoon we were to go full on but now we are like little slowed down but still i think in karnataka we are planting about uh, somewhere around 70 lakhs or 72 lakh uh, saplings which already farmers have been booked for so this is a comprehensive thing that it is a combination of trees so that the land rejuvenates right now uncd is very concerned about india because our soil is dying see when we say soil we are just talking about largely 39 inches of top soil on an average in the world there is 39 inches of top soil almost all life happens in this 39 because of this 39 inches of soil tamil nadu and southern india largely considered a blessed land because where we are right now we have nearly 18 to 20 feet of top soil which is a fantastic thing this is the reason why agriculture has been on here for over 12000 years or so there is history of agriculture because in some places here not so in southern tamil nadu probably but in this part western and northern part of tamil nadu 15 to 20 feet of top soil this is extremely rich place that way see we may think 
Richness means we struck oil, gold, diamond, this one, that one. But for the next generation, if you want the next generation to live a rich life, when I say a rich life, I am not talking about your stock market or your bank balance or something like this. Well, clean air, pure water, nutritious food and life is throbbing within you, this is a rich life. Rest of it is just, uh, you know, accessories to life. The real life is in this, how wonderfully a man can function, a human being can function, simply depends upon how pure is the air, how clean is the water, how nutritious is the food that you consume. If there is no strength in the soil, right now nearly forty-two percent of Tamil Nadu soil has been declared as fallow. That means it's becoming desert. So there is a whole movement to stop this desertification, but nothing much has happened on the ground. Too much talk has happened, conferences have happened, papers have been written, but on the ground, this is where Kaveri calling came in. For that, so many people are protesting against that. Do you know this? In… they're all located in Chennai only. They all… they are saying it's dangerous to plant this many trees. Can you believe that? They're saying it's dangerous. Before these people came or I came or you came, what was here on this land? This land was all trees. So how does it become dangerous to put back the trees? Simply because they're… they're only looking at it in some way, you know, because there is no money in this, that's their problem, I think. Because in every ecological thing, conference, go here, go there, there is money. Now action on the ground, there is no money you have to spend from your pockets. So, nobody is interested in this. But Karnataka government has taken the policy changes very quickly and very, very responsive. On the ground, things will happen there for sure. It should have happened much larger. We were preparing for a very big… Uh, this thing uh, during the monsoon. But now we have kind of toned it down a little bit because we don't know when it will become safe for our volunteers to go village to village, meet people, do these things. We are not sure about that yet. It doesn't look like Monsoon is about to start, already pre-monsoon showers are coming here. So any time monsoon will start pouring within the next week's time. So we are still not ready because we don't want to send young people out there and suppose somebody, you know, these are all dedicated people, we don't want to kill them, they've come, they're willing to give their lives, that doesn't mean we can take their lives, all right? So because of that, we've slowed down a little bit, but still over seventy lakh uh, saplings will go. See, we must understand this, the difference between this and afforestation is that this is going into farmland, private land. That means they will take care of it because it's their commercial interest. That is the fundamental difference that I've been trying to beat it into everybody's ha heads. But after talking for hours, in the end they ask, where is the land? <laughs> really, <laughs> I've just been seeing in various places I've been going and speaking to pe respons people who hold responsible positions, after explaining everything for one hour, in the end ask, all this is fantastic Sadhguru, but where is the land? The land is in the hands of the farmer. Only if you make it lucrative for him, you can put back these trees, otherwise you will only talk about it. We… we… we have a lot of this uh, discussion on farmers, right? Uh, every… every year, pre-monsoon, post-monsoon, we have… we hear small, small stories of farmers committing suicides, farmers struggling to pay off the debts, all these things are a regular feature. But aren't these people that are the ones that are putting food on our plate? Should we like, for example, say uh, like an engineering or a medicine, where we, you know, put children into it, promote the industry and make it a bigger industry, is it time for us all to invest and say our children must feel agriculture is attractive? Is, has the time come really? Uh, one hundred percent that needs to happen. If that doesn't happen, there's no food security for this country. Right now, we've taken some uh, kind of rudimentary surveys. What I see is not even two percent of the farm community want their children to go into farming. That… that is what it is. So in another twenty-five years when this generation passes, who will grow food for you? Right now in this country, there are nearly sixty-five percent of the population who know how to conduct this magic of turning f mud into food. Not a simple thing. But you're a engineering graduate, isn't it? I'll tell you, you come here, I'll give you ten acres of good land, very fertile land. Grow ten varieties of crops and show me, you will see it'll be a total failure. 
even if you are an MSc in agriculture, still you will be a failure, generally, except a very few who come from that community who know how to do this. Because it may... because a farmer looks illiterate, people think it's some silly thing to do. It is not, it is a very complex and very time-sensitive operations, the way it is done, the farming. Because the guy looks undernourished and badly dressed, we think it's something not important. You and me are eating only because of him. And it's not a small achievement, one of the greatest achievements... achievements of this nation is, we are managing to provide food for 1.4 billion people without any major imports of food. There's no any major import of food actually, we're exporting a little bit, a few small things are coming in. But generally we are able to provide. See, even in a situation like this, right now this virus uh, situation, even now during this pandemic, we have enough food. How to reach that person who has no money is another problem, but we have food in the country. Suppose you don't have food in the country, then uh, that disaster is a totally of a different nature. So farmer has done a fantastic job with no great technology, no great science, just with traditional knowledge. The only problem that he is facing, why you are seeing these suicides and other things is, one thing is there is no power of scale over generations, over, because we have history of thousands of years of agricultural history, over generations it's become smaller and smaller and smaller. Today, the average land holding in the country is one hectare, that is 2.25 acres. In 2.25 acres or for every 2.25 acres, there's a barbed fence, there is a borewell, there's an electric connection, there are pipelines, it's a complete waste of resources. For the amount of money that goes into it, there is no way he can get... he get to make it lucrative or profitable for himself. So this is what is leading to this. So right now this FPO movement, we have one of the best run FPOs in Tamil Nadu is run by us here in this region. It's an organization of about 1200 farmers. Now... now we are seeing how to scale this to 50,000 farmers. Right now on the ground, nothing much has happened. All we have done is to show them it works. All we have done is, there are three, four youth always on the phone negotiating these products. Just with negotiation, their income has gone up three hundred percent. Just with simple negotiation and timing the sale of the produ produce, this is all. And another thing is the inputs. We have set up a superstore where all the inputs, whatever the dealer margin was about twenty-five to thirty percent, that is going straight to the farmer. That thirty percent itself is a big... big thing for him. So, we are looking at if you put fifty thousand farmers together, it becomes a major corporation run by them. You can hire professionals, you can hire scientists to... So, you know, uh, agricultural scientists to see how, what crops to grow, how to grow and everything. We can hire, uh, you know, marketing uh, experts to do this. Or we can consult, we can handle this internationally. All this we are looking at because f from Kanyakumari to Kashmir, the latitudinal spread that we have in this country, the types of soils and weather conditions that we have in this country, twelve months of the year, you can just grow almost anything that grows anywhere in this world. And if we handle this capacity, this latitudinal spread and sixty-five percent still being capable of doing farming, if we handle this right, then we can become the breadbasket of the world. But right now, we have laws like this that, you know, this compulsory school education is killing the farming, totally. Every child goes to school, by the time he comes to... T till tenth standard, he need not pass, he just keeps going. Without learning two plus two, millions of them have reached ninth, tenth standard. Only in tenth standard he gets filtered. By then, he is physically not competent to work in the farm, mentally completely in a different way. He thinks he's educated just because he's gone to school. So we are completely destroying the future of farming in this country. It is time educated people invest and invest their children in the farming because it can be done in a very good way, there is enough science and technology. What is lacking is scale. Scale can be achieved by bringing them together as a farmer producer organization. There... there were many tax and other things which we got relaxed now. Uh, see, for example, if you are a farmer, how much ever you earn, there's no tax for you. But if ten of us farmers got together and made an FPO, 
then there is thirty percent income tax. So why will we come together? You are ensuring we don't come together. So I uh, appealed to the Prime Minister and he relaxed up to hundred crores earning, there is no tax. But now we are pushing why hundred crore limit? If farming has to survive in this country, you cannot give teachings, you cannot run agricultural institutions. All you have to do is make it lucrative. If it's lucrative, it will survive. Uh, Sadhguru, uh, forgive my ignorance if this question is not pertinent, but uh, the… you know, if you take a look at big communities in India right now, one is the movie industry is big. Uh, I'm not well versed with the movie industry. The, cric the cricket industry is really large, but… So when I speak about the cricket industry, until Kapil Dev lifted the 1983 World Cup, and later on when Sachin Tendulkar came into play for the country, the game was largely not money driven. It was… it was telecasted free of cost on TV. Then the TV rights came and the players started earning more. Is there… is there a possibility the way you're saying how large a scale this agriculture is? Is there a possibility that such people can come into the mix and make this a really large and phenomenal industry? Is there a possibility? Yes, uh, what, what else do you think I'm doing? That's what I'm trying to do. We are putting uh, our energies behind it, we are uh, raising money for this and above all giving a voice to it. See, right now, we are, because you mentioned the word suicide, suicide in not some… see, individual people unfortunately will commit suicide for variety of reasons. When over three hundred thousand people commit suicide in a matter of fifteen to twenty years for one reason, one particular reason of farm distress, nearly three hundred thousand or more than three hundred thousand people have committed suicide, let's say in this century, in the last twenty years. It's actually in about fifteen, sixteen years, let's say twenty years. Because some people will always debate, no, no, that guy died because he had family issues, this, that they're saying. But I'm asking you, they are usually the explanation is, ah, that's because he couldn't pay his bank loan, he killed himself, this happened, that happened. I'm asking you, suppose you are a farmer, you have a rich soil and abundant water, no matter what is your situation, would you commit suicide or would I commit suicide? Definitely yes. not. Right now, the distress is the soil is so poor. Soil is so poor, why did it become poor? You can keep the soil rich only by putting organic content into it. See, soil is full of life. If… Uh, if you… I don't know if you've been in a, a rainforest or, uh, you know, in southern India itself, in western Ghats, if you go inside the forest, just pick it up like this, you will see it's bursting with life, the soil. That's how it should be. But right now it is ploughed and left open for eight, nine months. It's really dead, first nine, ten inches, Twelve inches where the crop goes is completely dead. Whenever you fly from Chennai to Delhi, now you're in the Delhi team, I heard. So you have to fly Chennai to Delhi. Every five minutes, look out of the window. You will see India looks like a brown desert, except a few green patches here and there. Most of it is a brown desert because these are all agri agricultural lands. When there is no crop, they're just ploughed and left open to kill the soil. So, this kind of practices we have come to, because we st saw Europeans doing massive, uh, you know, uh, industry like farming. But now they've all changed, but we didn't change. We are still doing the same thing. It is very important. See, suppose you grow one ton of, uh, let's say, sugarcane or paddy or whatever from the soil, what you have taken out is one ton of topsoil, isn't it? Yeah. You have to put it back. How can you put it back? The only way is leaves from the trees or animal waste. Trees are gone long time ago. In uh, Kaveri Basin, eighty-seven percent of the tree cover has been removed in the last seventy years. And animals are all uh, traveling abroad. There are no animals on the farm. People think tractor will do it. Tractor will plow it, but tractor will not enrich the soil as animals would. Animals would work also and enrich the soil also. But now they're all gone, people thought they're useless and we are thinking just by putting salts, everything will be okay. For all those people who don't understand what I'm saying, you know, in our meal, in southern Indian meal, without salt we are not eat eating any food. Little bit of salt and so many other things. Instead of that, make it ninety percent salt and ten percent whatever else you want to eat. One meal, if you eat like that, you will understand what you are doing to this soil and to this country. 
Okay. Thank you, Sadhguru. Any, any, anything no. else? Anything else, Sadhguru? Well, uh, the sport in the world uh, <laughs> may not be the same for next uh, twelve months, probably. The no, no spectators, so there is no big excitement and stuff like that. But I think uh, this is a time we should learn to live with because there is no point risking those people who are vulnerable. Risking their lives is not our business because I am not vulnerable, I will go and do whatever I want to do is not a human way of doing things, we have to respect that. And we must make sure that the casualties are minimum and at the same time we must focus on putting this nation back on the track whether it's economy or sport or culture, everything should come back as quickly as possible. We can't just be locked up forever, but in a very responsible and conscious way. Thank you, Sadhguru. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure, it's been a dream for me to do this. Thank you for honoring it. Thank you, Sadhguru. Namaskaram. Thank you very much. All the best for you for whatever matches coming up <laughs> Thank you, Sadhguru. Namaskaram.